I had a talk with myself and I'm like, if you want to live a long and healthy life, it's time to make a change. You, I can't keep going in this direction. And um, I always intended to make a change at some point in my life. I, I, but I kept waiting for myself to have the strength to do it. I never did. But uh, finally, I guess just the, the big age coming and like, I need to do something now or it's going to be now or never. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. Today, I have a very special guest with me. He is a runner, a podcaster, and a man who's defied age and gravity. His name is Barry Karch, and he's the creator and host of Running for Your Life, a podcast that inspires people to take control of their health and start running at any age. He was kind enough to have me on a show to talk about strength training and nutrition, and I wanted to bring his perspective as a runner to this show, since it's a topic I admit we rarely discuss. In this episode, we dive into Barry's transformative journey from burnout to vitality through the power of running. Barry shares how reclaiming his love for running in his 60s became more than a weight loss strategy. It morphed into a philosophy for life. Whether discussing the secret of lasting motivation or how to defy the limitations of age, Barry's insights offer sound principles for anyone looking to seize control of their health at any stage of life. Barry became an avid runner as he approached his 40s. He participated in as many as 20 races a year, ranging from one mile to marathons and everything in between. He qualified for and ran the Boston Marathon, and after five years of intense training and running, he got burned out. He stopped racing for 20 years. The bad news was that he kept eating like he was running marathons. His weight kept going up and up until he had added 35 pounds. He kept asking himself when he was going to do something about the weight, but was never motivated enough to take action. Finally, when he reached his 60s, he got the determination to do something about the weight. He felt like if he wanted to live a long and healthy life, it was now or never. He changed his diet. The weight came off all 35 pounds. And as a side effect, an unexpected thing happened. He started to enjoy running again, really enjoy it much more than when he was younger. He's begun racing again with great results. He feels rejuvenated, like he found a part of himself that was missing for 20 years. And he created the Running For Your Life podcast to share his joy of running and encourage others to take control of their health and that it's never too late to get fit start to get fit starting to run. <laughs> uh, his goal is to have his listeners join him in outrunning father time. Barry, welcome to the show. Thanks, Philip. That's quite an introduction. You blow away my podcast. You do much better than I do on the introductions. No, no, we're not, we're not, we're not comparing. We all have our different styles. This is, this is my thing. It's all good. No, I, I appreciate it because I want people to understand who you are, where you come from and kind of get that background settled. And now what we can do is dive a little bit deeper. What I really want to know right off the bat is what does running mean to you? To me, running is youth. Running is life. Running is energy. It's being alive. It's just, it's feeling happy. I, I love feeling my heartbeat, hearing my breathing while I'm going out running. I, I never feel more alive than when I'm running. All right. So being alive, having energy, youth, vitality, all of that, uh, which is interesting because I also think like, like many forms of training and exercise, whether it's lifting weights or a sport, we have to enjoy it, right? Otherwise we're not going to stick with it. What would you say to people who don't have the same passion for running yet when you say, look, it's, it's energy, it's life. And they say, it sounds exhausting. <laughs> what do you tell them? Tell them? Well, you have to start like anything else. You start gradually. Mm -hmm. You don't need to start running one mile, three miles, five miles, your first run. You can start very easily, comfortable pace, even run a minute or two and then walk a minute or two and then run again another minute or two and see how you feel. See if you don't find that you do look forward to going outside. I like running in the morning early. Everyone has different times they like, but I love seeing the sunrise. I like yeah. seeing the day start. I like hearing the birds chirp and seeing the trees that just, there's nothing like it. So I would suggest yeah. just starting very slow and easy if you've never run before and, and do a run walk mixture. Sure. Well, that that's, that's good advice. So you, you've kind of been in love with running, then you lost it. You lost the passion and then you came back, it came back to you. Right. So you had achieved all these feats, impressive feats, like the Boston marathon in your forties, and then you got burned out. So tell us about that. Yeah. Um, entirely different eras of my life. When I, I didn't run until, as you mentioned, my later 30s, and I hooked up with a group of friends, and we all trained together, and which was good, good and bad, I guess, at the same time. 
it was good because it's a lot easier to run with other people than being by yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. So that was good about it. We had a great camaraderie. The bad was we always pushed ourselves so hard in that we never had an easy day or easy run. Every run, we were pushing ourselves to the limits of our abilities, which I learned later on in life is really not the best way to train. A more appropriate way is you should have one or two hard days a week, but the other days should be very easy. Effort level about three out of 10. So you're just going very easy, slow jog and enjoying yourself. We never did that. Hmm. We killed ourselves every day. And so there got to be a point where I just felt like I couldn't put myself through this anymore. Mentally, physically, it was just getting to be too much and not enjoyable. And I just, uh, I was trying to think of a way to tell my friend that I wanted to stop training with him because we'd done it for five mm-hmm. years and we were pretty good friends. Well, he beat me to the punch, kind of. One, more, one morning I showed up t- for our run and he told me, he said, Barry, I got news for you. I'm moving out of town. And so there you go. I never it even, t- I never told him, I never had to tell him I didn't want to do it anymore. So, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. That's such a common theme. I mean, even today, you know, I hear people who get burned out for one reason or another, and it, and it usually gets to the point where it becomes a chore and it becomes stressful in their body and they're not recovering, whatever it is, whatever form of exercise, maybe you, you do the spinning all the time, or maybe, maybe you lift, but you do it s- seven days a week and maybe you should be doing it three days a week. It's a really important message for people to consider because we want to separate the running itself from the mode with which you incorporated it. So over the 20 years that you were not running, did you try any other forms of exercise or training? And and what were they? Yes. After my friend moved out of town, that's when the next phase began, the 20 okay. years. I did continue to run, but I always ran, but there was a huge, huge difference. I slowed it down to a jog. I just did very slow, easy jogs. I didn't compete. I did not race for 20 years. Um, I lost all that type of fitness and I never could really run more than three miles. There's nothing wrong with three miles except for where I was before, where I was doing the 26.2 on marathons. I never went more than about three miles anymore. And one time during that period, I decided, you know what? I want to try to run a marathon again. And I enlisted in a training group and I never could get beyond eight miles and I was totally burned out and could not do it. So I, I did I guess you would call it a run, but it was more like a slow jog. So the style changed, the duration of it changed down to three miles. Other things I did, I I do lift weights too. I continue to lift weights throughout the whole 20 year period. Mm -hmm. And I still do now, not to the extent you do, but um, I do that. Um, Did I do any other sports really? I did a little bit of swimming. I'm terrible at swimming, but I did a little (laughs) bit of that just to take away the pounding on the body, the legs. So I would, I would do a little cross training there. I did a little bit on the elliptical machine again, Mm -hmm. when I didn't want the, the pounding on the legs, the legs couldn't handle it. Um, that was about it though. That was about what I did. Yeah. And you were trying to, so it sounds like you were trying to maintain your conditioning and your cardiovascular health, things like that with those other modalities, as opposed to being competitive anymore at the time. I tried to maintain my health, but it it did go way down from where I was. I wasn't in that peak running condition anymore. Well, so then that leads me to what helped you fall in love with running again. I think it was changing your diet. Correct me if I'm wrong. What was that what it was? Yeah, this was all an accident. I never anticipated running again. I never anticipated having a running podcast. I never anticipated being here on your show. So this is like, oh, like, wow, I can't believe I'm doing all this now. I just decided, as you mentioned, I I kept putting on more and more and more weight. Every time I went to the doctor, I weighed more and more and more and more until I was 35 pounds beyond my racing weight, which was quite a bit. And I was always trying to kid myself that, yeah, I still look good. I would look in the mirror. I guess I'd hold my stomach in and like, I don't look too bad. But I was kind of kidding myself about that. I kept having to buy bigger and bigger and bigger waist sizes on the pants. Mm. I went up six sizes on the waist. So yeah, I guess I put on quite a bit of weight there and I have this horrible sweet tooth. I just love sweets, which should make things easier for me. I love chocolate. I love ice cream. 
So I was chocolate eating that and stuff. ice cream right there. My yeah. two favorites too. <laughs> okay. How many, yeah. how many people can say that? <laughs> I know. I'm kind of jealous of people. Every once in a while, I run into someone that doesn't like chocolate. I'm like, I'm kind of jealous of them. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of a good true. thing. But uh, I I enjoyed eating that stuff more than I cared about the weight. Um, I guess I was just happy the way I was, and I kept putting on weight, putting on weight. And um, I finally, when I hit my 60s. I had a talk with myself and I'm like, if you want to live a long and healthy life, it's time to make a change. You, I can't keep going in this direction. And um, I always intended to make a change at some point in my life. I, I, but I kept waiting for myself to have the strength to do it. I never did. But uh, finally, I guess just the, the big age coming and like, I need to do something now or it's going to be now or never. So um, I did change my diet and I went to kind of a strange diet for a runner, but I went to a low carb diet because runners tend to love the carbs, mm. but I went to a low carb diet because I had done that briefly years ago and I know it worked. So I did it and I stayed on the low carb diet for about a year. It was hard, very hard for me, but I, I took off all the weight. So it, it, did, it did work. Mm -hmm. And you asked how I got back into running. I wasn't intending to get back into racing whatsoever. But then once I took all the weight off, just one day my wife casually asked me, she says, are you planning to do any races anymore? And I honestly never thought about it. And like, I guess I could, I guess I could see, you know, what I could do now. Cause I've been 20 years. I signed up for a 5k race, which, uh, for the listeners who aren't runners, that's 3.1 miles. And I, I ran it considerably slower than I ran 20 years ago, but I ran the thing and I guess there's a few benefits on getting old. There's less competition. And so a different class, like a, a different class. class. And yeah. I ended up first place in my age group. That was really encouraging for me. I'm like, wow, I got first in my age group. And I didn't really hardly train for it. So I started thinking, what can I do next now? And so I decided to do a half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. I did that this past December. And that was my first half marathon in 20 years. And this one I did train for. So you had hit a wall years ago with like the eight miles because you were so burned out. Yeah. Is there, was there some sense of recovery over all that time of not running? And now are you doing it in a different way that's more sustainable and quote unquote healthy? Entirely different. Yeah. Yeah. I used to not be able to run more than three days a week. And that's because I come to find out now I've, I've become friends with a running coach and I've, I, I had no coach back then. Hmm. Um, I come to find out I was running wrong back in those days. As I mentioned, I was doing, every run was a hard run, which is a mistake. So now I'm able to run five days a week, which I never did before. Three of my days are very easy. And I try to keep them, as I mentioned, around a three out of 10 effort level. And then I have two hard days. One day is a, what we call a speed run day, where I run shorter intervals, but at high intensity hmm. and, and okay. a much higher speed. The purpose of that is to get used to running fast. Mm. So when you run a race, like a half marathon or a 5K, your race pace is slower than these speed run intervals. So the race pace feels easier. That's the purpose yeah. of it, to make your race pace feel easy. Makes sense. So I have one day a week as a speed run, and we call it interval runs. And then one day a week on a weekend, I do the long run to gear up for the endurance needed for a half marathon or a marathon. So yeah. that's what I'm doing entirely differently now than I used to do. Yeah. I like that approach because it sounds, I mean, from what I understand about running, you know, there's the skill component, there's the power and there's the strength. That's kind of like all these different things. And what it sounds like you're doing is managing your fatigue and managing your stress and recovery so that you can continue. It reminds me of like, again, in lifting, you don't want to always test your max, constantly test your max. You're going to yeah. get burned out or eating. You don't want to constantly be di dieting, you know, or else you're going to get burned out. So it's a good principle. And so for people who are interested in running right off the bat, listening to this show, don't go crazy. Even if you are 25, you know, don't do what Barry did when he was back in his twenties, thirties or whatever. Take, take this kind of more measured approach. Cause the, what is it? What's the phrase? Like not taking shortcuts is actually the faster path. You know, the, taking the long game is actually the fastest path to success. What did you have to change in your mind to, to, I guess, not only lose weight and get back to like your previous health, but get back to the sport. Was it just signing up for the 5k and you were, you were sold or was there some more reflection that you had to go through? Well, I guess doing the 5k and, and ended up coming in first place was like, yeah. 
uh, the big motivated. wake up. It's like, yeah. wow. Yeah. It's very yeah. motivating. It's like, wow, I, yeah. I can still do this. And I hadn't really, like I said, I hadn't really trained for it. So it got me really psyched up. I, and I felt like, um, as you mentioned in the intro, I, I found a long lost part of myself because mm. I, I, I'm kind of a competitive person and I, I enjoy mm. the racing and that environment. And so I just really enjoyed it and decided, you know what, I want to see what else I'm capable of. And I don't have, I think maybe now at this stage of my life, I'm just thrilled with whatever I can do. Being in my sixties and running, I'm just happy to be able to do it because a lot of people can't anymore due to um, health issues, whatever, problems with their back, problems with their knees, hip replacements, all kinds of things. So I'm just thankful I can do this. And so I'm just absolutely thrilled with whatever I can do rather than being so dead set on time and what what was my pace as i was in my early days right so speaking of that the physical challenges as you age uh, if somebody were not if somebody had a sedentary lifestyle to this point and now they're in their 50s or 60s would you recommend running as an activity or maybe you know do something else for a while before you would consider running what, what's your advice there well i would highly recommend running someone who hasn't run before can start out with a run walk mix but i highly recommend running for a couple of reasons I think your most important muscle in your body is probably your heart. So cardio health is super important. I like exercising the heart and um, being very healthy that way. Plus, I believe that running also strengthens the bones. It strengthens the bones a lot from all the running. So it does a lot of good for you in your, in your health. And now I'm able to get around and do things that the majority of people my age and even younger aren't able to do. And it's yeah. all thanks to running. So I think it's an important piece. Uh, it's not the only piece. The weightlifting, as you do, is also very important to build muscle mass because you lose that over time also as you get mm -hmm. older. So yeah. I think they're both important pieces in the puzzle, but they both have a place. Yeah, no, I would agree that the combination of those two things, right? Resistance training for muscle and then some form of cardio for cardio health. And like you said, bone density or bone health and everything. Hi, my name is Lisa, and I'd like to give a big shout out to my nutrition coach, Philip Pate. With his coaching, I have lost 17 pounds. He helped me identify the reason that I wanted to lose weight, and it's very simple, longevity. I want to be healthy, active, and independent until the day I die. He introduced me to this wonderful little app called Macro Factor. I got that part of my nutrition figured out. Along with that is the movement part of nutrition. There's a plan to it, and he really helped me with that. The other thing he helped me with was knowing that I need to get a lot of steps in. So the more steps you have, the higher your expenditure is, and the easier it is to lose weight. When it's presented to you like he presents it, it makes even more sense. And the other thing that he had was a hunger guide, and that really helped me. So thank you, Philip. How does someone say motivated? Because running is one of those things, at least in my mind, it can get repetitive, right? It, just like almost any form of cardio, you, you can see it as this like putting in the time or there's there's maybe a different way to frame it and a different way to, to do it that's more enjoyable. So how would you suggest people get motivated and stay motivated to run? Okay. Let me, uh, I, I got two questions here uh, I want to answer. How do you get motivated and how do you not be competitive? I'm sorry, uh, repetitive and stay mm -hmm. exciting. Sure. So let me start with how do you get motivated? You have to have your big why. Why do I want to do this? Why do I want to run? And I'm sure you need the same, Philip, for your uh, exercising mm -hmm. because it's very easy just to lay in bed when, and say, ah, oh, forget it. I don't feel like it today. I'm not going to do it. Or I'm tired. Um, I'm going to take the day off. What difference does it make? You need that big why. Why do you want to run? Why do you want to lift weights? For me, I want to live a long and healthy life. I really want to live a long and healthy life. And I'm like everybody else. There's some days when I get up in the morning that I'm less than motivated. I don't particularly feel like running. I'd like to lay in bed longer. But I think about it for just a second. Living a long and healthy life is way more important to me than laying in bed for another 30 or 60 minutes. So I'm mm -hmm. out of there in a sec. So that's my big why. For someone else, it could be they want to take some pounds off. They want to train for a race or some other health issue going on that running is going to solve. It could be self-confidence. could be anything. But yeah. whatever it is, you need your big why. Why do you want to do this? And it's going to have to be strong to get you 
going on the days you don't feel like it. Now, once you do run, how do you stay with it? Is it boring? Is it repetitive? My answer is no, because it would be if every run was the same. If I ran the same route every day, the same pace every day, that's boring. Yeah, I agree. But I'm doing different kinds of runs. I'm doing those slow, easy runs. We call them recovery runs where you can just enjoy yourself and not have to worry about anything. Just take it easy. I'm doing some speed work another day to test myself, to see how fast I can go, what I'm capable of. And then I'm doing a long run to see how far I can go, how strong I can feel for how long. Plus the runs are all different. I do some of them outside alone. Some of them I do, I use a Nike run club training app. And I have a Nike coach in my ear talking to me during the run. Um, sometimes I'll listen to music. Sometimes I'll listen to podcasts like yours. Other times I'll be on a treadmill running in a gym. And on the weekends on my long runs, I'm typically running with a local uh, running group. So I'm running with other people. So everyone is different. And yeah. I, I enjoy them all. Oh, yeah. And, and you just gave us the entire list of things that contribute to motivation for different people. I love that. I mean, the first of all, the the why is definitely important. And I think of it as like, seasons or periodization, right? Sometimes our why changes or on any given day, you know, we may have three or four things really driving us, but one is, is the most, you know, the big driver of that day. Cause when people tell me they want to live a long, healthy life, like you did, sometimes that's not enough in the moment, right? It, it, it's not a short enough time kind of inspirational, yeah. but, but when they're like, yeah. And I looked at myself in the mirror too. Okay. Now I've got a couple different things. To right. and drive me. But you said, you know, having a coach, uh, habit stacking, you know, making it fun with using different variety, both with how you train, where you train, what you train with equipment wise, running with a group, big fan of community. So like any of those people listening can, can take one or two of those and figure out, Oh, okay, here's how I can get a little creative and make my workouts more interesting. So mm -hmm. thanks. Thanks, Barry. I, lo I love that. Sure. Um, you met, you did mention one of the things that can drive people's competition and I think you said that it helps to schedule at least one of those a year, some, some event each year that excites you and maybe scares you, right? Maybe it's going to push you a bit, which also ties in the idea of seasonality and goals and all that. Why, why do you recommend having a competition each year? You know what? I ran into this concept of a Masogi from a person by the name of Jesse Itzler. He didn't invent this concept, but he's the person who I learned it from. And what it is, is doing one big, scary, year-defining event every year. And that makes every year memorable too. So you can say, oh, 2023 was the year I did this. 2022 was the year I did that. It's something that excites you and scares you and challenges you and pushes you outside your comfort zone, perhaps. And it doesn't have to be physical, by the way. It can be going into business for yourself. It could be starting your own podcast. It could be getting married. It could be any number of things, taking, learning to play guitar. It could be anything that's something different for you, but a challenge, something you want to do and um, really gets you focused and makes life exciting. So that's the concept I came across from Jesse. And I never heard of it before. And it really intrigued me because I'd never done that. I never thought of it. And this year I heard of an event, which coincidentally Jesse is a co-founder of, but um, it's called 29029. It's completely out of my comfort zone. It's a mountain hiking event. I've mm. never hiked a mountain in my life. I've never hiked a mountain. I felt like I would have a good background for it with the cardio fitness from running and leg strength, but still I never hiked. And so what it is, the 29029, where the number comes from is that is the height of Mount Everest, okay. 29,029 feet. The goal in this event is to hike up equi the equivalent of Mount Everest within 36 hours. And mm -hmm. it's held in five different locations around the country. I went to Snow Basin, Utah for the time I did it. I did it two months ago now. And on the, every mountain's different where they hold it. The mountain I was at required 13 ascents. You climb the mm -hmm. mountain. You don't have to go down. You take the gondola down. It's all okay. about the ascent hike up, gondola down, hike up, gondola down. You got to do it 13 times within 36 hours to achieve a 29,000 to 29 foot vertical ascent. Wow. So that was my Misogi for this year. I trained for it super hard. They provide you with a 20 week training program. 
and they provide you with coaching calls. And I found that I really, really love structured training. I love having this plan tell me what to do every day. And yeah. I, fo I followed it to a T. And even so, it was still hard. It was still very, very hard. Oh, but, man. Uh, that must have felt I, great, though, to finish it. It was an awesome feeling to finish it. I was not going to come out of there. All that work, they give you a red hat if you complete it. A red hat signifies that okay. you ever stood. But I was not going to come out of there without that red hat, and I did manage to get it. Yes. That, that was your goal, right? To, to get it done. I was going to get that red hat no matter yeah, what. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Oh, man. Misogi. Okay. I, I love how you expanded. This is a, a broader view on this than I even expected because I was thinking specifically like an endurance event each year. And what you're saying is just pick one huge driving, challenging goal each year in any part of your life, mm -hmm. which is, it's great. I, I love that because now you got me thinking, you know, the end of 2023 is rolling around 2024 what do you want to do next and, and it, not necessarily New Year's resolution, but although I guess you could make it that, but it's like, yeah, what do you want to do in that year? That's just different than something you've done before that really pushes you. Now I'm going to have to come up with something, Barry. Thank you for the challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> What's 2024 going to be the year of? You know, and, and another thought that comes to mind there is as you grow each year, right, you you challenge yourself and there may be there may be ways that you push yourself within what you're already doing. Like for me, lifting, I, there's always seasons of building muscle, losing fat, whatever, but it almost gets too comfortable even when you're pushing yourself because you're used to how to do it, right? Like you've become good at it to where, not, not that it's complacent, but it's not what you're saying, something that gets you to totally think differently reach out to new people, get a different training program. Like just, that sounds exciting. So I just, <laughs> my passion's coming through because people are listening. I think this is a great uh, thing to try. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Philip, uh, I heard of an event years ago. I don't know the name of it, but it's a combination of weightlifting and running. And I okay. can't remember what it is, but maybe it's something for you to look into to add something oh, new to your, new to your oh, repertoire boy. that you haven't done yet. True, true, true. You know, I do like sprinting. I like when you're talking about the speed work. I said, oh, I would love that day. When you talked about tomorrow doing your 16-mile run, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but I had done it before. Years ago, I was training for a half marathon. Didn't quite get there due to an injury. But uh, yeah, I, I remember what you're saying. I, I would run in different locations. I'd run along a canal. I'd run on a, like a flat trail. I'd run on the road. And it was nice to bear it up. Anyway, one of the other things I'm always curious about people who are passionate about a type of training is how it has helped other things in your life. Like how is running, especially the way you do it now, or even the journey you went through from doing it the wrong way in the past to doing it better now helped you other areas of your life? Yeah. Good question, Philip. You know, it permeates the whole rest of your life. It turns out running isn't just about running. I've learned so many life lessons from it. I could go on and on, but basically uh, to summarize it all, it just provides so much self-confidence. It makes me feel good about myself and what I'm able to do and accomplish. And it just gives me confidence in the other aspects of my life. And from uh, work to just something as simple as feeling like I, I look better now that I've dropped four to six sizes in the pants again uh, from what I went up to. But uh, yeah, it's just overall self-confidence, um, sense of accomplishment that helps so much in everything. It is amazing how physical feats often have that translation, right? Because there's nothing more, I guess, visceral than doing something with your body and seeing it improve, especially now that you're 20 years older than you were at a different point and healthier. You know, I, again, I feel the same about, I don't know, squats or, you know, something that you're doing that's hard. You've done it. You've grown now. And now you look in the mirror and say, well, that's not as hard as it used to be there. That's progress. Right. And, and like you said, it makes you confident in other areas. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, in uh, running, there always comes a point where it's going to get really, really tough and you're run and hard and you feel like quitting, but I'm able to push through it and complete the run. And that also permeates into the rest of life because in work or everyday life, things don't always go easy, right? You run yeah. into difficulties, obstacles, Sometimes you might want to just give up, but I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not a quitter. I'm going to keep going and push through this and, and get through it. So that's just another thing you learn from, from doing yeah, this. Yeah, it's true. And I, I honestly think very, very few people, a, a sad, small percentage of people will do that. And the positive side of that is if you're listening to this, if you listen to Barry and you are the type that want to explore and become that larger version of yourself, it'll put you in like the 2% of people, you know, that, that actually do that. So 
Do you feel that you've outrun Father Time for a while at this point? <laughs> I, I, I do. Um, <laughs> at least I would like to think so. Um, I feel like I'm very healthy. I don't have any health ailments. I feel like I'm running really good. I'm able to keep up with people younger than me, which always makes me feel really good about it. And most people that I run into actually think, uh, they think I'm younger than I actually am, mm. which also makes me feel good. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, I'm doing okay for my age. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. When I first met you, I, I, you definitely looked younger than, than your age for sure. Uh, which comes with the vitality of, of staying healthy. If somebody listening wants to get started running, what are some good resources for them? Well, let's see. I love the Nike run app. Okay. It's free. You can download it. And, um, there's a bunch of guided runs on there. They're all distances. They, they have runs for beginners. They have like a uh, five minute run, a 10 minute run. They have a one mile run on there. But what's good about it is you have a coach in your ear talking to you while you're running the whole time. It kind of takes your mind off of it and it gives you a motivation, inspiration. I really like that. And some of their guided runs, they also utilize the GPS in your watch so that it mm -hmm. knows how far you've gone. Mm -hmm. And it will. they'll talk to you at the half mile mark, the mile mark, and so forth. They know when you reach those points to give you motivation and encouragement. So I really, really enjoy using that app. Okay. So that would be one I would recommend. Secondly, there's a lot of great running podcasts out there that you can listen to. And those are also good for putting on while you're running because they keep you motivated and determined to listen to other runners talk about things that you're going through yourself. So those are two really good resources, I think, to to get you going. Including, of course, Running for Your Life, Barry's very own podcast. So if you're listening and have any interest at all in running, definitely go follow that, subscribe to it right now. And I'm going to ask you one more question, Barry, that I ask all guests. And that is, what one question did you wish I had asked and what is your answer? That's a hard one. The question would be, what is your mindset? How do you keep going when your body is yelling at you to quit? stop. And that's something that I encounter on certainly all my long runs and probably a lot of my speed runs too. It's like, I can't do this anymore. I don't know if I can, I've got to stop. So what do you do when you come to that situation? And um, for you, Philip, I'm sure you're in that same situation too. Um, I, I'm not as familiar with the weights as you are, but maybe you're, there's a certain amount of weight you want to lift or a certain number of sets you want to do. And you're feeling like I can't do anymore. I'm tired. You know, that's it for me. So I have a couple of things go through my mind at, at those times. N number one is I heard someone say, remember tomorrow. And what that means is how are you going to think about yourself tomorrow? If you quit now, I know for me, I am going to feel terrible. I'm going to be really upset at myself. If I stop, I'm going to be very disappointed in my effort. If I don't finish this run and do what I intended to do. So I, I think, how am I going to think about tomorrow? You're going to have to go through a little short-term pain to finish it, mm -hmm. but the pain's going to end and it won't be that long. And you're going to have all that long-term satisfaction that you get out of it thinking that I did it. I can do this. Yeah, I'm not a quitter. So those are things that go through my mind when the going gets tough. I love it. Remember tomorrow. And what you just said is you, you learn something about yourself by making that extra push to get through it, right? You mentioned the lifting weights. The equivalent would be the heaviest weight you've ever lifted. Let's say you're going for five reps and you're on the third set and you've done three and it just feels impossible. You're not going to know if you can get the next one unless you try it. So you've got to push and it's mental, it's physical, it's everything. But remember the person tomorrow looking back and saying, and why didn't you do it? Right? <laughs> like, yeah. Come on. All you had to do is try. You were right there. You had the equipment, you were on the road, whatever it is. Like it just took a few extra seconds of effort. Um, so I, I love that message. All right, man. Where can listeners learn more about you and your work? Well, of course, the running for your life podcast, mm -hmm. which is available pretty much anywhere. People listen to podcasts. And also on Instagram at Barry underscore S underscore Karch. 
Barry underscore S underscore Karch. Yep. Okay. We're going to put that in the show notes. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. This is the most we've talked about running on the show ever. So you've got that place of honor Excellent. in the podcast. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate you coming on. And, you know, let's stay in touch, Barry. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. I hope it was fun. 